Well, I will be presenting a cultural project that we did uh, in Italy, uh, in Milan specifically, which is uh, Fondazione Prada Museum. Um, briefly, Fondazione Prada is a private institution that was founded in 1993 by fashion designer Mucha Prada with the aim to promote contemporary and modern art. Um, as part of a long-running collaboration uh, between the Prada Group and OMA, in 2008, uh, Mrs. Prada came to us with the idea of uh, designing a, a permanent venue for the Fondazione that up until that time was kind of a more volatile, let's say. They didn't have a proper headquarter. They were hiring venues here and there in order to, uh, when needed, let's say. The area the, they chose uh, was in the southern part of the city of Milan, uh, behind the Porta Romana dismissed uh, railway area, which at the time was kind of a very interesting place in the city because it was a sort of a time capsule of uh, uh, the late 70s. After its dismissal, everything was left untouched almost, and then there was this kind of neuralistic vibe still uh, existing there that was kind of a, a very eerie uh, feeling uh, walking for that area. The site itself was a former distillery that uh, uh, dated back at the beginning of the 1900 and have been active until, uh, let's say, mid-80s, when it was purchased by the Prada Group and used as a sort of um, secondary storage, archive uh, facilities with uh, smaller offices for at what at the time was the newly, brand, uh, newly born brand Miu Miu and uh, um, Luna Rossa. As you can see, the complex is already somehow presenting itself as a sort of citadel. It was a productive citadel that started out as a smaller uh, core, maybe, okay, here, like this three building here, office, um, bottling, and uh, the canister and alambic tower. And then all along the year, it kind of grew by simple addition out of necessity of other building, storage facilities, tables, silos, uh, and again. So in a way, um, this was, uh, there was a kind of random but coherent feeling in this uh, uh, very juxtaposed way of growth, of growing uh, of, the, of the site. And in a way, uh, there was no architectural aim, to be completely honest, but the final feeling is a kind of a uniqueness and uh, coherence that was a very interesting uh, uh, thing that we found when we start working there. This is the moment when we enter in the equation. And this slide is a kind of a very interesting dualism, uh, duality, challenge versus comfort. What is, in our case, challenge and comfort? I think that what we have been thinking when we were um, drafting this first idea is that, in a way, um, industrial space has become a sort of comfort zone for the contemporary art. There is a degree of predictability that everybody loves. And uh, together with the white cube, white box approach for uh, some galleries, it was a kind of uh, new establishment that we somehow wanted to fight or to expand, understanding if there was the possibility of adding into this system some more challenging and predictable spaces. And this is what we have been trying to do uh, with the project of Fondazione. This is the basic diagram of how we worked at the very beginning, analyzing all the existing spaces, finding which one was already kind of good for be transformed, converted into an exhibition spaces, taking down everything else, and making room for new addition in order to be able to update the program of uh, contemporary art incubator, adding, let's say, three new buildings, two new buildings and a kind of new one. Uh, we have uh, a temporary exhibition building here, a permanent exhibition building here, and a cinema multimedia multifunctional building whose uh, sitting here in a portion of an existing building. This is the final result, let's say, of this operation, where you can see that the existing building has been kept as it was. And you can clearly read our intervention. Temporary ex exhibition building, uh, permanent exhibition building in the form of a white uh, concrete tower of white cube stacked galleries. And there you can see the garden roof of the newly inserted uh, multimedia building, uh, plus a golden tower, but will be. I will go back to that later. This is another view where you can also see how these, uh, our operations somehow created a sort of very interesting uh, spatial variable within this kind of compound, combining a series of new elements that range from tall to short, 
broad, too, sh um, too thin. And so we are creating a sort of noise, a background, a degree of um, instability that actually could benefit the overall um, exhibition experience of the, of the compound because it can work as a whole museum, 20,000 square meters of exhibition space, or it could be broken down into 10 different smaller venues, 10 different smaller museums that can work autonomously, creating this kind of feeling that each one of the visitor could be his own curator, choosing which path, which way, in which way to use the whole project. Here you have some finished shots, let's say, of the finished uh, project, the main gate, the first uh, courtyard with the public function, bar and ticket booth, the main public space that sits between the temporary exhibition building and the cinema building, which is this mirror clad building over there, well, the tower, a secondary public space uh, which uh, is being created uh, incorporating existing building and plus some tweaking here. The tower and here's a kind of a new silhouette over the um, uh, Porta Romana railway area. We actually today are going to focus on one specific building which is the uh, temporary exhibition building or as has been dubbed the podium which uh, uh, was uh, conceived since the very beginning as a sort of a high performance, high flexibility exhibition space. The basic concept was the one of, uh, let's say, subtraction. We wanted to work with a kind of a very full um, surface to which we were able to carve out the spaces, creating this kind of um, opposite condition, uh, opposite exhibition condition building in which we have two very distinct uh, way of approaching the exhibition design, the, the exhibition setup, let's say. Ground floor, oops. Ground floor, we have a thousand square meter of column free space um, that is kind of reminiscent of art fair pavilion, fully programmable space, and in a way is also uh, homage to Ms. van der Rohnoye National Gallery in Berlin. Opposite to the first floor, where on the other end we have a completely closed box, kind of a jewel box, a kind of a high performance box that was always being conceived as a sort of super controllable, super reliable space uh, where uh, ancient and um, very fragile artifacts could be exhibited. Due to this kind of uh, carved out monolith nature, we always been uh, thinking that since the very beginning, the concept of a kind of a sponge of, of, as a material concept could have been very fitting. Since there is a kind of duality inherent in the material itself, it's kind of solid and void. It's almost like you can feel that those spaces can be considered as kind of amplified void within the, 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 the system of a sponge. And it also can be hosting a another series of dualities, like regular and irregular, natural and artificial, translucent and solid. I mean, it's a kind of a very um, different take, uh, an interesting take on that comfort versus challenge slide that we showed before also. Sponge doesn't come that uh, new in a way because it was already part of the language that Prada, uh, OMA has developed for Prada. And it first appeared in 2004 in the Los Angeles uh, Rodeo Drive uh, Prada Epicenter in the form of this uh, green foam is a poly polyurethane cast uh, sponge called the Prada sponge, which is a foam who's used uh, again for, uh, was been designed to be a kind of regular irregular. As you can see, there's kind of, you can read the, almost the, the paneling in a way. But again, it was there for this very specific quality that you can see, I think, in this picture, where you cannot really understand whether it's a soft material or it's a hard material. It's a kind of both in between, a combination, a very powerful uh, uh, imagery. The material was developed in different scale. The one that you just saw was the small sponge, uh, green or more milky in our, with a cast resin. There was a medium sponge that was supposed to be cast in concrete. This is a, spo a gypsum uh, um, sample and a bigger, oh, sorry, and a large sponge that was supposed to be cast in metal that was for another Prada epicenter that unfortunately didn't have made, you know, things. Um, then we decided that for our sponge we needed to go back to um, 
basics to the origin, and we took out from the archive the original blue foam model for the sponge, uh, thinking that could be an interesting way to start with this kind of re-engineering of the, of the foam as a sort of a much more uh, structural element, uh, working also in a way to highlight that kind of metallical, perfect machine feeling that we want the podium building to have. Uh, we were lucky to be able to go through a series of uh, experimentation process that, uh, with a series of trials that span from a very artisan uh, method to a much more industrial one. And the first trial was, like you can say, the obvious, try to cast that same uh, sample into an aluminum uh, element, in a cast aluminum element, creating this very... Uh, it's a, it's a kind of a very organic, uh, almost visceral uh, reinterpretation of that sponge. It's very, uh, in a way, it's kind of scary, I have to be honest. And uh, this is part of the process. It was a lost uh, foam process, so we used that uh, uh, blue foam model that has been cast and then dissolved during the process of uh, casting. Here's a picture of the foundry. Staying in the realm of the um, casting process with aluminum, we also tried another kind of uh, typology of casting, which is the coquille casting, which had an interesting uh, uh, feature about it. The ability to create a sort, of, a sort of square sponge, because the material itself is already giving this kind of porous uh, nature, almost like an erosion. But the interesting thing is that we could insert other scoops without in, inside the, the system in order to create this feeling of a much even a much more a much even deeper three dimensionality in the material again very uh, natural and very naturalistic uh, approach but so far we have always been uh, talking about pure screen with no actually uh, performance on the panel and then at some point we decided also to try to investigate uh, some more let's say uh, uh, high performance uh, way of cladding the facade. The first experiment we did was uh, with these polyester composite panels, which is the conjunction of uh, those polyester beads that you can see here and a kind of more regular insulation panel over there that you can sneak inside the, this hole. This is a zoom version of the same uh, panel. The process was kind of interesting because we were using this polyester composite, which was actually a technology that was based on uh, aerospace industry. So those beads were covered with the material. Those, let's say, those, sorry, those molds were covered with the material, creating those beads that were conjoined together and then cut to create the hole and combined to the final panel. So it's kind of a very, uh, a lot of, st a very stepped process. We also tried a more uh, homemade version of it using the um, glass reinforced plastic, which is a, another interesting material because of a series of reasons that I'm going to explain. And it's a very easy process. You, you need, just need a mold, you buy the, uh, the material, and then you lay on top of the mold. And this is, was an in-house made model, so it's kind of uh, easy, let's say easily manageable process. The interesting thing about this material is that it's a very mysterious in a way because you cannot really understand what is his own nature. It can be very metallic in a way, but at the same time, it's plastic, glass reinforced, so it still keeps a certain degree of translucency, creating a series of interesting effects during the day and night the changes. But again, during day daytime, depending on how the light will it's on him, it can also look like it's a kind of a iron cast, cast iron element. So he had a degree of mystery that was uh, very, very, very interesting and playful. This is the molding, right? uh, air balloon and uh, metal and, uh, and, and wood. So it's kind of a very interesting process. Another process we tried to investigate was the explosion molded aluminum foil which is exactly what it says. There was a company in Holland, in the Netherlands, back in the day, back, back 10, 10 years ago, that was trying to experiment this uh, literally uh, explosion process. The idea was to use this uh, uh, metal element as a part of a much more common sandwich panel, you know, like the very typical where you have a two layer of uh, um, aluminum and insulation element. We wanted to create something interesting with a two layer of aluminum, still keeping a kind of performance in it. 
the process is uh, this. You have a wooden mold, then you have a water basin, then you put the mold in the layer and you detonate the charge of explosive. And that's the result. Since the charge cannot be the same, they are different, they are a different kind of small uh, timing uh, and uh, uh, power uh, differences, those panels would have been naturally be different even if we were using the kind of same uh, molding system. A very pyrotechnic way, but at some point we realized and we faced the fact that we needed to somehow to rely on industrially made material that in a way were also easier to manufacture, to produce, to maintain, to replicate, etc., etc. And we got in contact with this Canadian company that was producing this aluminum foam panel. Commercial name is Allusion. And uh, it's not a new material, to be honest, because they have been using it for quite a long time, concealed within two steel plates as bulletproof panel for tank, car, uh, heavy industry, etc., etc. But they came to us uh, telling that somehow we, they were able to create a broad range of opening, a broad range of uh, different texture for the surfaces from bigger hole to smaller hole, to big opening, small opening. And the thing is that this material still belongs to that kind of spongy qualities that we were looking uh, in all the other experimentation at a different scale, indeed a smaller one, but still a very uh, powerful material. This was the first sample that they sent at the construction site and you can see how it can be very interesting, how it shines at light and how it can be again strangely unpredictable. So it looks like when uh, there's no signal in the television, it's kind of that, that, uh, that, that, that strange feeling. One positive thing about using this material is that the whole system uh, package of the facade somehow got simpler because we were using a uh, um, sandwich panel wall on top of which we were hanging in a sort of uh, ventilated facade system those panels. What is not conventional is the way or the dimension of those panels. The company up, up, up until that moment was providing panels just up to 3.5 meters. Um, we were unhappy with that. We asked them we, to push the production in order to achieve bigger panel and they ended up changing a bit their technology and providing us panel up to eight meter so they kind of tripled their uh, almost tripled the production production limit. The panel that you see in this picture are 5.5 and basically is the all span of the first floor. This was also a request made out of the fact that we didn't want, we agreed on using this material with a much more heavy paneling than other option, but we just wanted vertical joints. We didn't want to lose the monolithic nature of the building, also adding horizontal joint. And they delivered. This is a detail section, somehow a zoom on the detail section, where you can see how again, uh, reinforcing this idea of sponge, the aluminum foam is everywhere outside and inside the building for facade, roof, ceiling, and internal wall. This is some picture, construction site picture, where you can see uh, the floating roof and how it's been closed by the panel, and also how we've been able to conceal all the emergency and uh, smoker structures and stuff that somehow were forced to put inside the museum. But here also you can see how the transition between facade and roof it became, it is kind of a seamless way in a way. And this vertical, just vertical pacing doesn't really disrupt the monolithic effect. Also because we were aware since the very beginning that this building would have been seen from very above since we had a tower next to our site. Well, sorry, within our site there was a part of the museum that was a tower. So it was always been considered as a fifth facade, a very reliable and, and important fifth facade. Here you have a shot of the interior where you can see exactly what I was saying, like the, the encompassing nature of the material, where you have everywhere material, everywhere is aluminum, foam or anodized. The floor is not aluminum, it's 
we use this very uh, nice uh, silver travertine for my run that, especially in this shot, somehow really matches with the striping, the direction of the seam, the direction of the light, and also, in a way, also the, the noise that this material is making. You have some other shots. And here you have also another interesting shot. This is the eight meter panel that I was telling you before. This is a kind of a shot where you have a catalog of all the material that we used, basically. You have wooden cobble, uh, gold, existing uh, uh, plaster, plastic. And you see how the dialogue, we, uh, anodized aluminum, you see how the dialogue between all this material and uh, the aluminum foam is kind of very interesting. Also because the building is in the closest proximity is that golden tower, which, uh, well, it has a, the same metallic value of the aluminum. So you have this kind of very interesting dualism between these two materials, a very precious one, apparently, and a very poor one. Uh, interesting fact, in terms of cost, gold proved to be way cheaper than the all aluminum facade, like one-fourth. So if you want to cloud a building in gold, think about it as a cheap solution. But one another characteristic of this material that is pretty clear in this image is the mystery that comes with it. Oh, sorry. The mystery that comes with it. Here, depending on the light, you don't really understand the metallic nature of the material. And again, you basically, most of the people that comes to the Fondazione, they don't really know that is metal cladding. They still feel that, that there is a kind of stone nature in it. So again, it kind of sits in between, in terms of perception trick, between stone and uh, metal. Kind of uh, another sponge quality that we were somehow uh, exploiting. Going in the wrong direction. Okay, this is another shot of the out building, let's say, also relate to the existing part of the, of the Fondazione. And this is the last shot where somehow you can summarize again that comfort versus challenge uh, slide that we were talking before. Here you have the comfort of an existing building, which is poked in one eye by the challenge of a completely blind metallic mechanic piece uh, on top of it.